ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so today then insha'Allah ta'ala we begin the new series of lessons This series of lessons which will be focused on the topic of aqidah Because aqidah is the basis of the understanding Aqidah is the very core of what a Muslim requires to know of His aqidah in Allah His aqidah regarding the angels, the prophets, the books, the messengers, the day of judgment, the decree, in particular of course, is the first of what we mentioned, aqidah, regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, aqidah regarding the names and attributes of Allah, aqidah regarding what Allah has informed us of Himself in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, <coughs> so aqidah is certainly one of the key topics and the most important of topics and in fact as the scholars have mentioned the aqidah regarding the names and attributes of Allah it is the greatest type of knowledge the aqidah regarding the names and attributes of Allah is the greatest type of knowledge. Why is that the greatest type of knowledge? Because as the scholars they mention, the greatness of a particular knowledge, it is determined by the topic of the knowledge. So when the topic and the subject here is the names and attributes of our Lord, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowledge of who your creator is, then there can be no knowledge greater than the knowledge of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. (coughs) Hence the scholars have said, this knowledge in recognizing and understanding who your Lord is, in recognizing and understanding what Allah has told us about Himself, it is the greatest of knowledge for you to know who your Lord is, for you to know who you are praying to five times a day, who you are standing before in that worship, in that ibadah. For a person who doesn't know who his Lord is, then he is going to be very deficient in his ability to worship, and in his understanding of the religion. So this aqidah, it is something vital. It is something of the highest degree, that a Muslim must understand, what is the true iman, the true belief that we have in our hearts. In particular, it's even more important, Because the Prophet ﷺ, when he informed us, إِنَّ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ سَتَفْتَرِقُ عَلَى ثَلَاثٍ وَسَبْعِينَ فِرْقَةٍ كُلُّهَا فِي النَّارِ إِلَّا وَاحِدَةٍ That this ummah will split up into 73 sects. All of them in the fire, إِلَّا وَاحِدَةٍ Except one. The companions, they said, قَالُوا مَنْ هِيَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Who is that? Which one is the saved sect? O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ informed them that the saved sect, مَا أَنَا عَلَيْهِ الْيَوْمِ وَأَصْحَابِي that which I am upon today and my companions. This hadith informs us from the Prophet ﷺ himself, 
that this ummah will split up into different sects. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that's gonna happen. And that all of these sects, they are in their beliefs and their practices heading to the hellfire except one. The one that isn't is obviously going to be those Muslims who cling on and stick to the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam exactly in aqeedah, in all aspects of the religion, in understanding the Qur'an and the sunnah upon the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the point to mention here, that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us these groups will occur, how will these groups occur? Where will they occur? How will they occur? Why will they occur? Throughout history you can check, and it becomes clear that the majority of this splitting which occurred in the ummah, this differing and people moving away from the path of Ahlul Sunnah was over the issue of Aqeedah. It wasn't about the issue of Rafi al Do you have to raise your hands in the prayer? Rafi al That isn't the issue that makes the 73 sects. That isn't the issue. Is it uh, 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 in the prayer whether you have to put your hands back on your chest or down by your side after the ruku'a? That isn't the issue. Is it other fiqh issues? It is not these fiqh issues. That's why you should never get into debates and arguments with people when they come and they want to debate with you. They say, we are following this madhab. In our madhab, there is no raf'ul yadain. You say to him, alhamdulillah, no problem. That isn't the key problem in our discussion. Raf'ul yadain isn't the key issue. Other fiqh problems you want to bring up, they are the key issue. None of those fiqh issues are the key issues. The key issues that made that differing in the sects was in this topic of aqeedah. It is the aqeedah that determines whether a person is upon the straight path or whether he is deviated. Because when it comes to fiqh issues, that doesn't make a person out of Ahlul Sunnah or not. Even if a person didn't do certain points of the prayer, which are Sunnah of the prayer, then it wouldn't exit him from being Ahlul Sunnah. But he's missing out on the Sunnah. But Aqeedah, if you have the wrong belief regarding Allah, you don't know who Allah is, you don't understand what Allah has told us about Himself, then that is a big deficiency. Certainly every Muslim knows, and from a young age as kids you learn, the six pillars of Iman. The six pillars of faith. Iman in Allah, and then the angels, the books, the prophets, the day of judgment and the decree. The first one always, Iman in Allah. When you learn about the five pillars of Islam, the first one straight away is the shahadatain, la ilaha illallah. The core is always that iman in Allah. The core is always understanding your Lord. Who is your Lord? Who are you worshipping? And that's why when you die in your grave, the angels, when they come and question you, one of those questions straight away is going to be, Man Rabbuka, who is your Lord? So certainly it is important that we understand the reality of Aqeedah, and the reality of what we are supposed to know regarding our belief in Allah. Because in the Qur'an, in the Sunnah, Allah has told us about Himself, certain things about Himself, certain names, certain attributes. Allah has informed us of Himself. So what are these things that Allah has informed us about Himself? 
That is what we are going to study and learn throughout Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyya. Because throughout Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyya, this book, it mentions those different names and attributes and different aspects regarding our belief in Allah. As an introduction, we should mention firstly, that when it comes to names and attributes, the names and attributes of Allah, of course we know that Allah has different names, even when you read, for example, the Basmala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, and then you say ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah, in the name of Allah, and then you say ar-Rahman, what is ar-Rahman? Ar-Rahman is one of the names of Allah, ar-Rahim, one of the names of Allah, so we know straight away from that, that Allah has different names. And there are many names that Allah has, which He has informed us of in the Qur'an, in the Sunnah, and that is what we will come to see. Similarly, Allah has attributes. Allah has certain attributes about Himself that He has told us about. And those attributes, similarly we will cover. But there are four main points to note as an introduction. Because to study Aqeedah, you need to have the basis established. Four main points when it comes to Aqeedah of the names and attributes of Allah. One is this issue of Ta'atil. Ta'atil is basically rejection and negation. That we do not perform ta'atil when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah. We do not reject or negate. So now when it comes to this ar-Rahman, we don't say no, no, ar-Rahman isn't one of the names of Allah. Invalidate that. We do not do that. We affirm the name Ar-Rahman. We affirm the name Ar-Rahim, unlike all of the other names that come. So we do not invalidate, nullify, negate any of the names or attributes of Allah, clearly. So that is point number one. We do not have any rejection of any of the names and attributes of Allah. Point number two is Tahrif. That we do not try to distort or alter the meanings of the names and attributes of Allah. We cannot <coughs> try to change or alter or distort the names and attributes of Allah. Again, everybody can understand that very clearly. Allah tells you something in the Quran. In the sunnah about himself, you leave it as it is. It's not up to us to change and alter. Why do some of the people of innovation change and alter when they see the names and attributes of Allah? Because of something we're going to study later on. This problem they have of taqdeemul aql ala naql. That as far as the people of innovation are concerned, your mind has to be able to register the names and attributes of Allah in some intellectual way. If your mind cannot work it out in some intellectual, rational way, then as far as the people of innovation are concerned, change and alter, tweak the names and attributes of Allah into a way that it will then logically and intellectually register with you. So, we're going to get to those examples later. But things like when they say, Allah tells us He descends to the lowest heaven in the last third of the night. <coughs> that Allah descends to the lowest heaven in the last third of the night. 
people of innovation because of all of their complications. They say, but Allah descends. How can Allah descend? It cannot be an X, Y, and Z. So long story short, they say, no, in that case, let's tweak it. It's not Allah who descends. It's Allah's angels. Allah sends His angels in the last third of the night. Or some of them will say, no, it means Allah's mercy comes down in the last third of the night. Not Allah Himself. Or it is Allah's ability or Allah's blessing that comes down. So they give these interpretations, tweaking the texts in order to make it fit. They can make it fit, okay, Allah sends His angels down. But Allah comes Himself down to the lowest heaven, closest to the earth. That doesn't make sense in my mind. Need to tweak it so I can make it make sense in my mind. So instead of me believing Allah comes to the lowest heaven in the last third of the night, because that's exactly what Allah tells us Himself about Himself, but they say, no, it's His angels that He sends. But that is called tahrif. Distorting and altering the texts to make them fit for yourself. That we don't do. If Allah tells us in the Quran, in the Sunnah, that He descends to the lowest heaven to the earth in the last third of the night, and then says, مَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُنِي فَأَغْفِرَ لَهُ who is seeking my forgiveness and I will forgive them? Man yas'aluni fa'a'tiya. Who is asking me and I will give them this hadith which is narrated by how many companions? One or two? No. Multiple companions. Companions upon companions upon companions. Huge numbers narrated this hadith. But the people of innovation cannot work it out. Allah descends? No. The angels must descend. So they distort and alter things slightly to make it work for themselves. We as a principle say, we're not going to do that. That is not the way of Ahlul Sunnah. Allah told you something in the Quran and the Sunnah. You don't change the meaning of that or tweak it unless you've seen some explanation of it from the Prophet ﷺ himself, if he's told you it means X, Y, and Z, okay. If he hasn't, you've got no right to tell me it means Allah's angels come down. When Allah says it is himself who comes down, you see the very clear method of Ahlul Sunnah. Allah tells you he descends in the last third. We say, look, Allah says in the Quran, in the Sunnah, etc. For example, that he descends in the last third. So that is what we will accept. If you want to tell me anything otherwise, you want to tell me it's the angels, etc. You've now given that interpretation from where? Is it hadith from the Prophet ﷺ? No, in that case we're not going to accept it. Is it explanation in the Quran somewhere? No, then we can't accept it. So point number two is, we don't do any of this tweaking. We don't try and tweak things around as they are in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the guidance that Allah has sent us, we will stick to that. And that is clearly the correct way. Anybody who tries to tweak things, then where are you going to end up at? Now there's 40, 50 of us in this room. If everybody, if I said to everyone, Allah descends in the last third of the night, what does it mean? And everybody tries to think of an explanation. How many explanations are we going to end up with? 50 different explanations. So who's right then? That's exactly what happened with the people of innovation. They all tried to tweak, so you end up with hundreds of different explanations. Which one is correct? None of them. The only correct one is what Allah told you exactly in the Quran and Sunnah. Stick to that. Don't need your interpretations. The only interpretations that are valid are the interpretations of Muhammad wasallam and the Sahaba. Outside of that, doesn't matter which imam you tell me, those interpretations are not going to be legitimate. So point number one, we don't do ta'atil, rejection or denial, we accept. Point number two, we don't do tahrif, distortion, alteration. Point number three, and these points are very important as an introduction. <coughs> point number three, is that we do not do takyif which is 
trying to give details and explanations and imaginations of what the names and attributes of Allah are like. That is very important as well. That when Allah tells us He descends in the last third of the night, for example now, the same example, we don't try and give a description to how Allah descends. Because some people, what do they start saying? They say, okay then, so Allah descends in the last third of the night. The last third of the night these days, when is it? In the UK, in February, it's around about 3, 4 o'clock in the morning till, or, or 3 o'clock till 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. The last few hours, the last third of the night. So then when it's 8 a.m. here, it is now sunrise. But across the Atlantic, in the islands and those places, it's going to be the it's going to be their last third of the night still. And then as you go around to the east coast of America, and then you keep going around in the world, somewhere in the world always is the last third of the night, isn't it? Somewhere in the world is always the last third of the night. Right now, somewhere in the world is the last third of the night. On the eastern side of the world, their day has already finished long time ago. Their morning is going to start soon. So down that side of the world, Australia, Malaysia, they're probably in their last third of the night, or even gone past it by now. Always somewhere in the world is the last third of the night. So how does Allah descend in the last third of the night? All the time? 24 hours? What's the answer? The answer is, this is the people of innovation who talk like this. The people of innovation, they talk like this. Allah told us He descends in the last third of the night. He didn't tell us, now you need to sit down like philosophers and work out, okay, so look at the map of the world and look at how the sun rotates and look, and last third is here, last third is there, last third is always there. So is Allah always just descending? That's not our concern. Allah didn't tell us to sit down like philosophers and work those things out. Allah told us when your last third of the night comes, then stand up in prayer, make dua, Allah answers your dua. When the last third of the night in Australia happens for them, they do it. When it happens in America, they do it. There's no issue of how. How does Allah descend? And how does the last third of the night work? This point number three is, we don't get into this issue of how this and how that. How does Allah descend? And how does Allah do this? And how can it be when the last third... How? 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 That how is where the people of innovation got so sucked in, into how and how, that they sat there with all of their intellect and their rationale and logic, trying to work out the hows. All of these million different how, 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 and they ended up in all types of innovation, all types of philosophy. Okay, well, it must be this then, and it must be that then, to try and answer all of these hows. When Allah has not given you any worship in trying to answer these hows and delve into these hows. So point number three is, we do not get involved in any imaginations of how this happens, and how does Allah do this, and how does Allah's attributes work. Allah hasn't given us that knowledge. Allah told us in the Qur'an, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You have not been given from knowledge except... A small amount. Allah has not given us knowledge of everything. Allah has not told us about Himself everything. But we've been given some small amounts. Allah has told us about some of His names and attributes. The details of how and what, Allah hasn't told us. And neither has Allah made it an act of worship for us to research into that. It's not an act of worship to research in and work out how does Allah descend in the last third of the night. No, that is only the research of the people of innovation who went astray. So point number three, we don't go into trying to imagine how it works, and trying to imagine Allah and His attributes, and trying to give some sort of descriptions to Allah's attributes. Some of the people of innovation, they make up a lie, 
against Ibn Taymiyyah. They say on one occasion, <coughs> they say on one occasion, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he got up on top of the member. He got up on top of the member, stood up on top of the member. And then the three steps of the member, he walked down. And he said to everybody, just like I have descended from the member, this is how Allah descends in the last third of the night. That's the story they tell you. At one time, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he climbed on top of the member, and then he walked down, and he said to them, just like I have descended, Allah descends just like that. Now that would be obviously clearly comparing Allah to creation. This story is false anyway, it's been proven by the historians because the narrator, the narrator of the story puts down a certain date. He says it was in the year such and such, in the city such and such. I was traveling and I saw Ibn Taymiyyah, I came across him in one of his mosques. He mentions like the year and the location and everything. When the scholars and the historians checked out the story, that year, that location, it was absolutely impossible for Ibn Taymiyyah to have been there, because that year and that location at that time, Ibn Taymiyyah was in jail. He was in prison that one time in his life. At that time, when this person claims to have seen Ibn Taymiyyah doing this, the historians, they verified Ibn Taymiyyah was sat in prison at that time. So it definitely wasn't Ibn Taymiyyah walking down the member. So these types of stories they make up. But we know that there is no comparison. So point number three, we don't go into details and descriptions and Allah's attributes, this is how they work. And Allah descends, this is how He descends. The how question, and this is a simple rule to remember, when it comes to names and attributes, the how question isn't a valid question. Just like when it comes to the decree of Allah, Allah decrees certain things to happen to you, good things, bad things, these decree that happens for you. In the decree, there is a question you're not allowed to ask. Which question? Why? When it comes to the decree, a Muslim doesn't ask the question, why? Something bad happens to you, you don't say, why me? Why did it happen to me? Be patient, this is the decree of Allah. So when it comes to the decree, you don't start saying, why, why? And when it comes to names and attributes, you don't say, how, how? So in names and attributes, there is no how. Allah hasn't told us how. How Allah descends, Allah hasn't told us. In the decree, there is no why. Why did this happen? Why did Allah decree this? Why did this person have to die? Wrong. So in decree, you do not ask why. In names and attributes, you do not ask how. The fourth point is the issue of tamfil. Tamfil is resemblance and comparison. This has to be understood clearly too. Because the whole of the Hawiyah is going to talk about names and attributes, etc. Or many sections of it. So point number four is, when we're talking about the names and attributes of Allah, it has to be understood it is impermissible to ever try to compare Allah to creation or to make any resemblance or any type of imagination of Allah being like the creation. That's why this story of Ibn Taymiyyah is completely a lie. That he walked down and said Allah descends like this. Resemblance that would be haram to make any resemblance of Allah to creation. So when we say Allah descends in the last third of the night, you do not have any imagination of Allah descending in any particular way. But all you do have is an understanding that in the last third of the night, Allah has descended to the lowest heaven and is telling you, make dua and answer your dua. You know that much, so you stand in prayer, you get up and you pray in the last third of the night. You know that, you know Allah has come to the last third of the night. How and what and imagining it, that we don't know. So point number four, we do not make any resemblance, any type of uh, comparing Allah to creation in any way. And all of these four points, they are proven in the ayah, 
which is the foundation of names and attributes, the ayah, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِعُ الْبَصِيرُ That there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that means you cannot do any type of how, you cannot do any type of comparison or resemblance. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can never try to imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, just because there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doesn't mean that we reject the names and attributes of Allah, because Allah then says to you, وَهُوَ السَّمِعُ الْبَصِيرُ And He is though, the all-hearing, the all-seeing. Hearing and seeing are two of the attributes of Allah. So you can see here in this ayah, in the first part, Allah tells you there is nothing like Allah. Don't try to compare or make any resemblance between creation and Allah ever in any way. But despite that, recognize though, that Allah does have names and attributes. Both of those mentioned together in the ayah. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِي شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ سَمِعُ الْبَصِيرٍ there is nothing like Allah, but He is the all-hearing and the all-seeing. What is the proof that we can take from this ayah then? That we affirm the names and attributes of Allah, but we do not make any comparison to creation. So now Allah tells us He is the all-hearing and the all-seeing. They are two of the attributes of Allah. We affirm Allah is the all-hearing and the all-seeing. We do not go into how does Allah see then? Is Allah, does Allah see like we see? And is it in this type of cut? None of that type of discussion or debate. How does Allah see? The how we do not go into. But we know that Allah is the all seeing and Allah is the all hearing. But without any discussion, how and what's the, what, how does Allah hear and see and is it like us humans or this or that? Those things, nothing. There is no imagination or comparison of the attributes of Allah to creation. So we affirm the attributes, but we do not compare them to creation. Allah is the all hearing, even though we can hear, we can hear, with our ears hear, we hear. But does that mean that when we say Allah is the all hearing, that we have now made a comparison between Allah and us? None whatsoever. Even though we hear. And now you're saying Allah's attribute is that He hears. So now it's the same attribute, isn't it? But is it any comparison or resemblance? Zero. Allah being the all hearing, us being able to hear, there is no comparison whatsoever. The attributes of Allah do not have any resemblance to our attributes. Allah is the all seeing. We can see. We have the attribute of seeing or not. Absolutely. So when we say Allah sees, are we not affirming the same attribute as us? But with no resemblance at all. We affirm Allah is the all seeing, but no resemblance to us and how we see. No imagination of us and how we see. That is an absolutely critical point. This point of being able to affirm attributes to Allah without any comparison or resemblance to creation. Is that possible or not? Absolutely. Allah is the all hearing and the all seeing. He tells you in the Quran, do you believe Allah is all hearing and all seeing? Yeah. Absolutely. Can we hear and see too? Yeah. Absolutely. Is there any comparison between Allah and us then? Absolutely not. Therefore that proves to you, you can affirm the names and attributes to Allah, but you're not making any comparison of Allah to us. That is a very important point to note. The fact that you can affirm names and attributes to Allah, which in their names, we may have. Hearing, we have it. Seeing, we have it. The names of those attributes, we've got them. We're going to affirm them to Allah, but in a manner 
which is befitting of the majesty of Allah. Allah is the all hearing in a manner befitting of His majesty far removed from creation. Allah is the all seeing in a manner befitting of His majesty separate from the creation. So now you have affirmed these attributes to Allah without making a scrap of any resemblance to creation. That is a very important point. Because when we come to some of these other attributes later on, the problem the people of innovation have, when it comes to issues like Allah mentions hands, in the ayah in the Qur'an Allah says, that He created Adam alayhi salam with His two hands. Ayah in the Qur'an. says Allah created Adam alayhi salam with His two hands. <coughs> people of innovation will say no. Allah hands cannot be the case. So they do ta'atil. Reject that. Or they'll do some tahrif and they'll distort it. They'll say, no, all it means is that Allah created Adam with his power. Not actual hands. Ahlul Sunnah, they say, look, stop all of that. Stop all of these interpretations of yours, all of this intellect and logic of yours. We as Ahlul Sunnah are going to stick to the same thing we've just been saying about Allah being all hearing and all seeing, which is that here now, Allah tells us He created Adam alayhi salam with His own two hands. That's the word used, biyadayya, with my two hands. We're gonna say, okay, Allah has hands in a manner befitting of His Majesty without a scrap of resemblance to creation. Why can't He do that now all of a sudden? When it was with the hearing and seeing, people of innovation would have been okay, okay. We can affirm Allah is the all hearing, the all seeing, even though we have the attribute of hearing and seeing, but without any comparison or resemblance. Okay. But now when it comes to this one, you say exactly the same thing. Allah tells you now, He has hands that He created Adam with. So why can you not say the same as the hearing and the seeing? That okay, Allah has hands. As a matter, in a manner that is befitting of His majesty, without any resemblance to creation whatsoever, just like the hearing and seeing. Now they'll say, no, no, no. Why? Why no, 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 now? What has become different now? The only thing that has become different now, is that in their intellects and in their minds and in their rationale, the whisperings of the shaitan have got to them to a level where they've started to imagine things. They've started to imagine Allah with hands, like how we have hands. Because they can't get that imagination out of their heads, then they have to do something to either tweak it like we said, or to reject it. So often, the modern day ones, they try to tweak it, because they don't want to say they are rejecting the names and attributes of Allah. They'll say, no, no, it just means, it just means the power of Allah. Allah created Adam with his powers. Why have they done that? Because with this one, they just can't get it out of their head, the imagination. Ahlul Sunnah, we tell you a thousand times, no resemblance to creation. Don't go into how. How are the hands of Allah? How did he create Adam with his hands? What is the appearance of the hands? No. Innovation to go into that type of thought. But the people of innovation with their philosophy and the way that they took it historically, they can't get it out of their head, this imagination that comes to them. But Allah says He created all with hands, hands like we have hands. They can't get it out of their imagination now. They are stuck because the imagination, they can't block it in their head. So now they have to tweak it or distort it or reject it. So now they won't accept that Allah has hands. They say, no, uh, we just don't, we don't know, Allah Alam, let's just leave that to Allah, whatever it means. Well, in that case, if you want to just leave it to Allah, whatever that means, Allah is the all hearing and the all seeing, say the same thing. Say that you don't know if Allah is the all hearing and the all seeing, we're just going to leave that to Allah. Allah affirms, He hears and sees, we can hear and see. So now, say the same thing then, say in that case, hearing and seeing... Allahu A'lam, we're going to consign the meaning to Allah. We don't know what that means. We don't know if Allah is the all-hearing and the all-seeing. We're going to consign that to Allah. Will they say that? 
Definitely not. If you say to somebody, is Allah all hearing and all seeing? They have to admit that. And this is one of the problems with the Asha'ira. The Asha'ira, they admit because they have to, they accept some of the attributes and they reject others. That straight away you can see is going to be a false methodology. Where and how and upon what have you been told to accept some of the names and attributes of Allah and reject other names and attributes of Allah? That's wrong. The principle is one and simple. So, I think the problem is today we're running out of time. We'll have to stop on that brief overview. But that overview, you have to remember it. Because as we go through the book, it is vital to have that background knowledge, those principles in your mind as we go through. Next week, we're going to start with the biography of Al-Imam Al-Tahawi, an introduction about him, his life, who was he, Al-Imam Al-Tahawi Al-Hanafi, and also about Ibn Abil Iz Al-Hanafi, and then we're going to start the first part of the book, inshaAllah ta'ala. So next week, 7 o'clock again, huh? 7 o'clock next week, inshaAllah ta'ala. We'll start with the biography of Imam Al-Tahawi Al-Hanafi, and then start the first part of the book where he talks about the aqidah of Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Abu Hanifa, he was upon the correct aqidah. So this book, it starts with the aqidah of Imam Abu Hanifa. That's what we'll start with next week, inshaAllah ta'ala. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين